Welcome live to the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Steve Spreester. As we are on the eve of Veterans Day, we're going to try to help as many veterans as we can in this Spreester session. It has to do with burn pits and the people that have been exposed to them when they were overseas, especially in the war against terrorism. We are talking about millions of people. Some of them are suffering health effects. Some of them have suffering from cancer and other ailments. There is now a way to get help easier through the Veterans Administration. We're going to talk about all this coming up. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about the legislation that was passed and why it makes it so much easier. And we have an ex expert panel that is with us tonight, and I want to introduce the panel right now. First off, I want to introduce Jane Babcock. She's a retired worker from the Veterans Service Office in Wisconsin with more than 20 years of experience helping veterans and active military understand their benefits. Jane, thank you for being with us tonight. Absolutely pleased to be here, Steve. I also want to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Chad Moniz. Am I saying that name right, Lieutenant Colonel? You absolutely are. Okay, he's a retired Army veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is also a burn pit victim with knowledge on the process to document claims with the VA. I also want to welcome my new friend. I hope I can call you that Tim Jensen. He's a retired Marine. He's also a burn pit victim as well as a co-founder of Grunt Style. And Tim, I want to start with you. Why did Grunt Style and yourself get involved in helping people that have been exposed to these burn pits? Yeah, Steve, it's a great question. You know, it's a bit of a long story and I'll truncate it down. Uh, you know, I was walking through the office one day and we have a customs business within Grunt Style. Had a conversation that was going on about burn pits, picked my ears. Uh, I had a lost friend in 2012 to this uh, very scenario and this circumstance. Uh, so it caught my attention. I wanted to know more. And that's when I got introduced to Rosie Torres. And Rosie's been an incredible, incredible uh, advocate for this through the many years, 15 plus years. Uh, I've been involved for four. And you know, through that time period, we were responsible for educating and, and informing our audience of over 10 million people within Grunt Style. And we've taken that and really moved the ball down the field. Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just got legislation passed. What does this legislation do? Well, I think the you know, the most important part about it is that three and a half million veterans of the global war on terrorism have now been entered into the system. They have the ability to get the, the health care that they deserve for the time that they had in service uh, in the 20 year war. Lieutenant, I want to start go to you next, Chad. Um, what has this exposure? At, do you have health uh, adverse health effects after your exposure to these burn pits? I, I have some, but they're minimal compared to many other people that have experienced way worse. Talk about the the ailments that people are suffering from because of their exposure to these burn pits. Well, as it was just mentioned, you know, it's from just minor uh, treatment that needs to be done to all the way up to death because of cancer and, and other things are going on, as it was just alluded to. Tim, talk a little bit about that, that as well. I mean, this is something that affects millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that the scariest part about this entire thing is the latency period, right? You know, a lot of these, um, these, these cancers and these ailments are 10 to 15 years from the time of exposure. Uh, myself, you know, I started showing symptoms uh, for my skin disorder. I have uh, uh, psoriasis, no history in my family. Uh, within the last three years, now my, I've, I've got these uh, skin issues all over my body, right? That the, it's just coming out. Uh, and this is very typical within the, the, the global war on terrorism veteran. Uh, and then you've got the, the cancers, right? The, the cancers that are just wiping out our community. Well over 200,000 individuals have died from this. Yeah, uh, brain cancers. Mm -hmm. I mean, other type of cancers, Absolutely. correct? Uh, we're talking breast cancer, uh, reproductive cancers, uh, brain cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. Uh, the list is very long. And we were uh, very succinct in identifying, you know, at least 23 cancers uh, in the PACT Act that was, you know, really what is affecting our community. And we were able to capture that so the, these individuals don't have to go and arbitrate, um, you know, uh, against the VA uh, for cancers and they're just going to be rolled into the program. Right. The PACT Act has basically made it much easier for veterans to get the help they need. Reducing hurdles. Yeah. And, and Jane, I'm, I'm going to bring you in on this question because when you deal with the VA, sometimes there are hurdles, as Tim said. I mean, what has the PACT Act meant for veterans who are out there who are suffering some of these effects from the burn pits? Well, those veterans and their families, especially surviving families, need to find that accredited 
veteran service officer that's nearest them. There are thousands across the United States. 32 states have county employees and the rest have state and or veteran organizations like VFW and American Legion. These folks, because they have a paycheck, do not charge to help educate you about benefits, help you apply for benefits. They know what information is needed and they can request an expedite. God forbid you're one of the glioplastoma victims. That can be expedited and returned as a, an award if you have the proper evidence in the claim the first time within two weeks. How was, what was the process like before the PACT Act was passed? The process itself has always had reasons for expedites, any terminal illness, financial hardship, past due bills, things like of that nature. But most people don't know that because it's hidden in the Code of Federal Regulation. And if you don't read the regulations, I'm kind of a geek. I love reading. <laughs> you're, you're kind of a geek that's helped a lot of people, I think, go through this whole process. So I, I appreciate what you have done as well. I mean, it, we're, is it just burn pits, though, too? I mean, are, it's also opened up uh, Agent Orange and some of the other, if you, were in, in, if you were exposed to some of these toxins, correct? Yes. Agent Orange already has 38 cancers with it. So there's all the ones that are on that list, except the one difference is glioplastoma is on this list for our youngest veterans, but it's not on the Vietnam, Thailand, DMZ, 12 mile blue water, all that stuff. It's not on that list, but living in rural USA, I dealt with 11 guys that had brain cancer and only one of them didn't go to Vietnam. Wow. So That's we've a, still got to fight. Yeah. yeah, there's still work to be done. I mean, you had some uh, some help in this whole thing too. I mean, uh, John Stewart was involved if I'm if I'm not That is correct. Uh, John Stewart, John Field, uh, the reason why we brought them into this conversation and this largely goes to Rosie Torres and the Burn Pits 360 organization uh, was their playbook that they ran during um, the 9-11. 9-11, right? right? So yeah. they've already done that. They've walked the halls. They've already created a lot of these relationships. And most importantly, they created the fund. And that's what we were looking for. We had to create a fund that was going to be uh, accessible for these individuals as they're coming into the system um, with the, these new cancers. And I think we were able to achieve that. And, uh, you know, big hat goes off uh, to John Stewart and John Field for the work that they did there. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel, can you talk to us about what this means for the process? I mean, what the PACT Act helps with and, and what the process with the VA is like, you know, before and after this thing was passed? Yeah, so some of it kind of Jane just talked about. It, it makes some of the process easier. Now I can go in there and register on the burn pit, um, which has been around for a little bit, but the PACT Act now has these predestined that it's already kind of pretty much uh, – hand waved or approved upon the uh, the award process and the documentation versus having to go through a very lengthy medical process for proving that it was tied to um, your, your service in those areas. So you take the burn pit registry, print it out, go to the VA and have a, a specific conversation around that in a medical exam. And it's it's approved a lot more, uh, a lot quickly in the process versus going through back and forth. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, because before, basically the onus of proof was on the soldier themselves, correct? It, it, it was in a lot of ways. I don't know if other people have different, you know, perspective, but yeah, the onus was on the service member to provide the documentation, the orders of the deployment, the actual being there. Um, and sometimes it came down to flight manifests, uh, whereas now it's, it's not near as cumbersome. Yeah, it, Jane, talk me through this. If, if I'm a military veteran at home and I suspect that I may, I, well, I mean, if you were over there, you were exposed. But if I suspect that I may be having some health uh, conditions because of my exposure, what's the first thing I should do? Well, first, the VA requires a current diagnosis. They can't rate what they don't know is medically diagnosed. So you have to get a diagnosis, so get that diagnosis. But you can go ahead and start that claim. I tell veterans all the time, if you have a major health issue and you know you were chemically exposed, whether it was jet fuel because you refueled jets and or in this case, the burn pits, which sometimes had burning mercury and other 
items like that in it. File that claim for that condition. Go ahead and make sure you've got your current diagnosis and then let the VA possibly deny it this time, but then you could turn around and it may be on the list later. Also, it can still be fought. I actually won a veteran for glioplastoma from Vietnam, but I had to get the two denials from VA to hand him off to a VA lawyer who then set him up with a genetic oncologist who was able to prove he had no risk factors for cancer. Yeah, glioblastoma, brain cancer, such a deadly diagnosis to get. Tim, talk about burn pits with me. Why were they necessary, uh, especially in the, in the war against terrorism, when we're talking about Iraq and we're talking about Afghanistan and some of the other places? Right, right. You know, we, we were operating in a, a, a SASO type of operation, right, uh, where we're providing security and stabilization operations within Afghanistan and Iraq. With that being said, that's a big footprint, right? There are millions of people, uh, Americans, that are coming in from contractors to the military forces. And with that being said, that's a huge footprint. That's, that's intelligence for the enemy, like picking up our garbage, understanding how we eat, understanding our routines. So uh, the best and most effective way that the DOD found to get rid of that was, you know, throw JP-8 on it, JP-5, you know, set a big pit and burn it on fire, right? This has been something that's been going on since all the way back into World War II and, you know, long, long period of time. So this is, this is not new, but I think the footprint into which we were operating, it was much different than we've seen in previous uh, conflicts and the exposure, um, you know, I can re recall from my instance, I was within a hundred yards of living within a burn pit in a very small confinement in Yusufia. Right, this is, you know, indicative and you know, uh, constant across the entire military during the global war on terrorism. We find our, ourselves in, in very austere environments, and we still needed to burn our trash, our body parts, all these different things that were going into combat. Right? Yeah, Jane was talking about mercury, mercury, batteries, Bing. lithium, vehicles. Yeah, all part of these burn pits. Mm -hmm. Talk about um, when we move forward from this? I mean, obviously we're talking about, you know, if we talk about Agent Orange and some of the other toxins that were out there, but how many people just in the war on terrorism are we talking about? How many soldiers do we think uh, were possibly exposed? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think, you know, with, it, with all being said, you know, three and a half million veterans uh, and Americans have flowed in and out, right? And that's just the American forces. We're not talking about contractors. Right. 100% uh, of them have been exposed, right? I think the numbers that we, we that Rosie and I are talking about from Burnpits 360 and uh, some other information that's flowing around, 25 to 30% of us, uh, of those numbers, of that three and a half million, are going to be exposed and d have to deal with something, it be it a skin, a uh, lung, cancer, some sort of exposure is going to be inhibiting their ability to live healthy and gainful lives. So we're talking about three and a half million people that were exposed mm -hmm. in all likelihood, and we're talking about well over a million that are having side effects, yeah. or having and some sort of adverse effects, I should well, 100%. say. Well, 100%, and you know, the, the, the scary numbers of it all is there's about a quarter of a million of those that are already dead. I'm just gonna let that sink in a little yeah. bit quarter of a million people that are already dead because of the effects of, of these burn pits. Absolutely. And people you know. People I know. My, my dear friends, my, my CO's dead, my XO's dead, my best friend Frank Hazelwood's dead. Um, and you know, that's just, just in one, you know, one company, one, yeah. one battalion. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Chad, I wanna bring you in here. What would you say to people who are at home right now watching this live stream? A couple things. Uh, one, you know, always document everything you did, just like Jane said, submit the claim today. But there's some ways to make sure that you can start taking care of that. And, and as it was discussed with Tim and Jane, the, the scary part on some of this is we don't know the effects because they're going to be years down the road for some of us to have the full determination of what the effect of it was. So make sure you have a copy of your medical records. If you're in the military now and, and you're watching this, then get a copy of your medical records before you leave. It's, it's a free service that you get anyways. Keep that in a safe place. Make sure that you check your DD-214 on the way out. Make sure that every place that you served is on there and all the medals are absolutely correct. That is a help of a linkage to be able to document you're there should medical files go missing in some capacity. Um, keep that in a safe place. Go see the VA on the way out and, and don't hide anything. 
be upfront and truthful on everything that you've got, all your elements, uh, whether it's minor or not. Keep keep a record of that, and and ask those that are close to you, what differences have they seen in you? What medical issues have they heard from you? Document that because it'll probably jog some memory. Because most of us, you know, Tim, I'm sure you'll you'll attest to this. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm good to go. Like I, I can go back out and deploy tomorrow, and that probably is not the case. But for us, it is. That that's our calling. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. So talking with those that are close to you and keeping those medical records are, are great. And, and as a key, you know, you have deployment orders, but sometimes they get misplaced as well. Make sure your DD-214 is right before you get out. Yeah, and like you said, be honest. You, you were very clear about the fact, be honest with the doctor or the physician that's examining you, but you also want to be honest with yourself with what you're seeing, correct? Yeah, and that's, that's the whole piece of talking with the families to figure out from what they saw and then having that that candid conversation and you said being honest with yourself like tomorrow is not promised we understand that but we got to be honest about that and make sure that if we're not feeling good that we actually talk to somebody about just that yeah that is correct tim you agree with that 100 percent. and you know i think the beauty of what the pact act is uh really is you know we've, we were able to capture so many uh, generations of the warfighter yeah. from vietnam uh, to the atolls uh, Gulf War, um, the, the, the water situation in Lejeune, uh, and that's great. I'm, we're very proud of that. But I think the, the, the beauty of the PACT Act is protecting the warfighter that hasn't even experienced these conflicts that are down the way, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, I, that was a learning that we took away from, like, you know, we saw this in Vietnam. We're not going to do this again. Like, the, the, the living in the past is over. Let's, let's correct things that haven't even happened yet and set ourselves up for success. Because yeah, I got children, one of my children is in the Navy right now, and I don't want that individual or my, or my son uh, having to be exposed to things that, you know, we raise our right hand to go fight our country. We don't come back to fight for our lives because of what we've been exposed to in the, in the process of doing so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, I mean, there's no limit on this. I mean, there's no cap on it. I mean, these this are even people who may not, who may be watching right now and not have not seeing any kind of you know health problems yeah. that may like Chad said see it down the line and they are also covered under this yeah. pact act you know and think of think of the hope look at the hope that this has provided for so many people that you know I have friends that are that are suffering from glibulastoma uh, right and for a long period of time they've been just surviving and surviving and surviving and now there's legislation out there and a law that says hey we're going to be able to you know we're going to give you some dignity you're going to get that health care Come in, come into the VA. We're going to treat you. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to recognize yeah. there's a problem, which is also a big part of this. Correct? Absolutely. Uh, we're giving, we're putting up some resources for veterans right now. These are places that you can go, both locally and nationally, to get some help, to get some of the answers uh, that you may have, uh, hopefully answered. Uh, Jane, if somebody's watching right now and they're uncertain. Uh, what to do, what would your advice be to them? Best relationship that any veteran and their family can have is with their accredited veteran service officer representative. That means in 32 states, your county office. Take that DD-214 down, let them get a copy on file. That way, if you're unconscious in the emergency room, your spouse calls and says he's part of the VA healthcare system, that VSO can contact the VA and say, he's in this hospital. If he's not stable, they'll leave him there and the VA will pay that bill. If he becomes stable and needs ongoing care, then they will transport him to a VA hospital if they have a bed available. But if they don't have a bed available, you're gonna stay local. Yeah, it, and so what what should you do right now, even if you're not having feeling health effects from burn pits or, or some of these other things, Jane? What would you tell people to do just in case it happens? Enroll in VA healthcare. These are the folks that are collecting the data. So they know the numbers. They know what to look for at your annual physical that they wouldn't look for in, say, a Korean War veteran. Yeah. So they're going to look for different things. And then also get a hold of that county or state or organization accredited representative and go in, see them, get registered, get set up, 
they may go through your medical or your military history and say, oh, did you know that New River, which is near Camp Lejeune, is also part of the water problem? Do you have any of these conditions or do your children or your spouse because they lived there also and drank the toxic water? So they're going to study every year. They go to school for a week to study the latest and greatest changes in the VA rules. That's who you need to know. Yeah. What are the common mistakes that you see people make? As far as VA goes, well, most of the guys, we do the drive, you know, suck it up and drive on. Oh, he needs it more than I do. I'm not going to bother. Or I have a job. I have insurance. I'm going to my local doctor. But you still need to do that once a year physical. Yeah. Get, get on the registry. Get the newsletter that tells you, hey, we've just realized that this now needs to be a presumptive. Come in and get tested for it. Arm yourself by being part of the VA and then use the VA benefits, not only to protect yourself now in your current life, but also if your death is contributed to, it hasn't, doesn't have to be direct cause, but contributed to by your service things, then your surviving dependents are entitled to benefits. Benefits that could keep them above poverty, provide education for a child that's getting ready to go to college. Right. There's so much. Yeah, if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your family. It's, it's part of your legacy. It's part of what you deserve. Yeah. Definitely. I think there's a, a part that, you know, we are also responsible for our own health care, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need to be talking. We need to be exploring. We need to be looking at things. You know, uh, I think there, it's important to understand if there are organizations out there, you can go and get a blood test, like a, a heavy metal blood test. You can get a toxic chemical blood test. Know what's going on with your body, right? Have those conversations with your primary care provider because those conversations are, is what is going to help you when you need to move that conversation over to the VA and say, hey, you know, that, that skin rash that I had for you know, what we were treating as um, a ringworm is actually, you know, uh, uh, a carcinoma of some sort. And now, and now I have a bigger conversation I need to be having with the VA system because they can tie that back to an exposure that I had from permethrin being sprayed on my uniform uh, because of leishmaniasis in Iraq. Right. right. That's, that's the nexus conversations that we're talking about here. Right. So it's very important that we are getting involved in our own health care and we're not leaving it up for chance. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Moniz, I want to talk to you too. What are some of the common mistakes that you see out there or that you've heard maybe from uh, some of your fellow soldiers? It's just a lack of knowledge in that department. And so therefore, you know, it's not, nothing's wrong with me today. So I don't go to the burn pit registry and, and you know, answer the questions there truthfully. Um, there's nothing wrong with me. So I don't go see the VA. I don't document uh, anything. And, and I just kind of work through it because I'm, you know, I'm fine. And, and like Jane said, like the other guy deserves it more, um, you know, some of the things that individuals have seen are just horrific from death to loss of limbs, et cetera. They absolutely need the VA more than I do. But at the same token, there's enough VA to go around for all of us. And so we need to have that conversation and schedule those appointments. And, and most of us just won't do that. And that's the common mistake is don't go to the burden pit registry and don't go see the doctors to document anything because I'm okay and the other guy needs it more. What, and and when, you, when you talk about dealing with the VA, I mean, we're just saying that is daunting for a lot of people. I mean, it's something that, that, that they don't even want to start thinking about. They need to, uh, what is the steps that they need to take and how did you find navigating the VA system? Now, to be truthfully honest, it, it's, it's painful, it's hard, it's time consuming. Um, like right now, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm having a hard time getting in to see my PCM. And so just to add one more thing to that, like the burn pit registry or some of these things that are going on, you're right, it is daunting. And if, if I'm easily deterred because I'm doing okay, then I'm not gonna fight to be able to go see that doctor that I need to, and I give up because it's easier for me to go on about my way. And by the time I see the doctor, I'm a little, I feel better, so I'm, I'm good. Even though I'm not, I feel that way. And so, yes, the VA, it is, it is a difficult system to get into. You have to be persistent. 
and you have to document your your conversation. Dane and I were talking right before this and, you know, hey, put it in writing. And you'll get a lot more response. Well, I had just started doing that last couple of weeks because of the back and forth that I've had with my current doctor. And they're being more responsive when I put it in writing than making phone calls and them canceling my my uh, appointments. Now, when you talk about putting it in writing, you're talking about being on the website and and a chat or you're talking about emails or all of the above. I'm talking about really start owning your health like um, Tim was saying. Go to My Health Evet. They've got a secure messaging system. And then if you need to do an audit trail, guess what? Now you have in the VA system, you can do an audit trail on that. And you need to go see the victim's advocate or the VSO, or you need to call the White House in order to be able to get them to help you out because you're not getting the support you need at your local VA. Then you can pick up the phone and call the White House support line or go see your local um, uh, patient advocate that's there at the uh, local VA and, and get them involved in the process and to get you the help and the, the care you deserve. Yeah. Jane, you want to add on to anything that uh, the Lieutenant Colonel Moniz just said? Yes. The White House hotline is 855-948-8255. One, one, call them, register your complaint. Call them if you need to know where to go to get help. Call them if you are homeless. They will set you up if you are at risk. Yes, the 988 suicide hotline is a national number and it's designed for everyone across the country. But if you press one as a veteran, you will speak to someone who knows our language. Yeah. So they're out there and they're more than happy to help. I love my VA. I love my VA providers. They have literally saved my life. But yes, it can be a long wait. And when it is a long wait, there is community care. Because of the length of time it takes me to drive to Milwaukee and the length of time it takes me to get my annual mammogram, they send me to my local hospital because I tell them, oh, community care, refer me, and they do. So use that community care too. If you're a veteran that's much older, say a Korean War guy, or you have a disability, whether it's service related or not, that prevents you from driving, let them know that. Tell them to put you on community care for your specialties and stuff. You're gonna make somebody drive an hour and a half to get dialysis three times a week? No, they're going to put you on community care. Yeah. yeah. Use the assets and benefits you have. Now, we're, we keep putting up a, a Bear County is where San Antonio is. I know you're in you're in Wisconsin, so you may not know that. But we, we're putting up the Bear County Veterans Service Center number. And that's where you say people should start, correct? Yes. Start with your county. If you don't have county folks, move up to the state. They usually have county or regional people and then move out to your organizations. The organizations themselves generally don't have more than an office or two in your state. So Our you may be better off starting with your county. But again, that also gives you somebody right down the street, might be your neighbor, and they have a boss down the hall. So if they're not doing a good job, you can walk down the hall and yeah. say, they're not doing a good job. But you can also walk down the hall and say, wow, I couldn't get in till 5.30 last night, and my CVSO was waiting for me at their office. Yeah. Compliment them, too. Yeah. Yeah. As somebody who used to work in one of those offices, you appreciate that, I'm sure. Is that somebody that can walk you through the process when we're talking about the daunting task of, of interacting with the VA? Can you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I after I retired from the military, when I was injured and suddenly found myself in the retired reserves, nobody said VA. Four years later, I saw an ad in the newspaper, went to the training, and it was just like, oh my God, there's so much out there, and that's why the CVSOs go every year. They have to go to training or they lose their accreditation. Yeah. So they know the latest and greatest. All right, I want to open this up to the entire panel. Is there anything we're missing here? Anything we haven't talked about yet that we need to talk about? 
You know, I, the one thing I would uh, I would add in to this conversation is the resources that the va.gov is providing on the website, right? There's a, a plethora of information uh, in regards to the PACT Act. Uh, right on the landing page, you can click right into it and it lists all of the links and everything that's involved in and what they're, they're rolling out. Um, you know, just most recently, uh, on, on the 8th of November, um, they just had some more rollouts of, of opportunities and benefits. Uh, the first of, the, of the January 2023 is when the benefits package of this will start rolling out and uh, we'll, we'll see more people coming in. Right now, they've, uh, the, the VA is reporting over 150,000 people have come in to the service, uh, just specifically of the, back, the PAC deck since August. So that's great news. The information is getting out there. People are starting to see that this exists. Um, and to much of what the panel said, go and register to the, to the registry, right? Um, go apply for your benefits and your compensation and, and the packages that you're entitled to. If you get denied, that's fine. It's still being annotated, and when January 1st comes around, you're gonna be right in line. Um, you know, another thing that the VA has done that will be happening uh, January 1 is people that are suffering from cancer right now are gonna be moved to the front of the line. That's huge, yeah. that's very huge. Uh, so, you know, in some of the conversations I've had with uh, Secretary McDonough, uh, for all the veterans out there that are listening and you, you don't have faith in the VA, I get it. Like, we've, we've all been spurred, right? We've had some bad relationships with the VA over the years. But there are a lot of great people out there. They're, they're making improvements. And I, from my mouth to your ears, Secretary, Secretary McDonough is making this a full court press for the PACT Act. This yeah. is where 100% of the attention is being focused on, and I, I, I feel really good about it. Yeah, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. If we do nothing else in this live stream, I'm hoping we're giving people knowledge where they can share it with family members, loved ones, whatever, and, and know that help is out there, and this is how you can get started. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moniz, I want, I want to give you uh, uh, an act. Is there something that we're missing in this whole thing? Is there something we need to bring up? No, and just I, I just say tell everybody don't be scared to reach out and, and talk about the resources. You said knowledge is power, right? Like I'm on LinkedIn. You can hit me up. I'll get you connected with somebody. Um, Tim has been open every time that we've had those conversations. Jane's wide open. Don't be afraid to reach out and, and contact somebody and, and ask the questions. Or if you want to be discreet about it, ask one and we'll get you connected with somebody that we can. Love it. Jane, I'm going to give you your final thought here before we wrap this up. You are now a member of the world's largest family, most diverse family, U.S. veterans. Find those veterans that already know. Listen to them. Reach out to myself and chat on LinkedIn. I'm happy, and every day I send at least a dozen people all the VA 101 basic tools. I send them the link to find their accredited VSO. And the other thing I want you to do is find that VSO, get that appointment, and also learn what the wartime veterans pension is. The youngest man I put on it was 21 years old because he became totally disabled after he left the service due to a motorcycle accident and would have been living on less than a thousand dollars a month from social security. Mm. But because he served during a wartime, he was entitled to another $900 from the VA, but he wouldn't have known if he hadn't learned about the benefit. Yeah. Tim, your final thoughts before we wrap this up. Listen, uh, you know, this, this generation of the warfighter has carried an incredible burden over the last 20 years. We've been asked to do a lot of, uh, a lot of things for this country. Um, and now, you know, that, now that the war is over, um, we're all trying to heal in many different ways. And you know, a lot of that is uh, on hidden wounds from PTSD, TBI, to the toxic exposures that uh, we were exposed to. Um, you know, I think that uh, we have a lot of work to do as a, as a, as a community, and it's gonna be us, the, the war fighters, that take care of our, ourselves, and we're leaning on each other's shoulders to, to make sure that we're bringing everybody across the finish line. And that's what I love about this community. That's why I'm, uh, I continue to fight for this community, and uh, I will always be involved in this community. I hope you know we're here to help. Absolutely. Yeah. Tim, Chad, Jane, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who have uh, tuned in to watch, thank you as well. I hope you realize that not only help is out there, but also hope is out there. There are ways to get the help you deserve. From all of us at KSAT 12 News, thank you for watching.